Okay. Well, I'm trying to be a little funny by the title of the sermon. Um, I'm not one of those preachers that gets up and jumps and scores and hollers and hollers and everything like that. Uh, you know, the, the kind of stereotype of the good old uh, country preacher who, you know, preaches hellfire and damnation. And, and uh, as I used to, four congregations to tell me, you need to step on our toes or wear our still toe shoes. I'm not that, really that type of person. But every now and then there does come a time where we must share the awful truth that there will be judgment one day. That uh, there is judgment. And that's true. But to be honest with you, some of the methodology I don't approve of. That's the way some people convey that truth. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to these things called hell houses. you ever seen those? It's like how many special you might find a church today every now and then trying to scare people into salvation by showing the evils of, you know, it's like a haunted house, but it's like, you know, what would it be like in hell type thing? Uh, and a lot of these uh, fire and brimstone type preachers are known for trying to scare people into salvation. That's not me. And, and I apologize in some ways that it's not me. But I do want to tell the truth. I do want to tell you the truth that there is a coming judgment one day. That one day those who are without Christ will be judged. Um, and it will be, uh, won't be a good situation. It won't be. You see, the, the, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, it is filled with descriptions of the judgment. And one of the things that we've learned uh, on Wednesday nights is the book of Revelation is so steeped in the visions and the, the language and the, 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 the uh, notions of the Old Testament. In fact, this past week we were talking about Revelation uh, 8 through and 9, the seven trumpets. We talked a good bit about uh, the Old Testament. Talked about the Passover. We talked about this passage as well that we're going to look at today. Joel chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 2 and then 10 through 17. You see, Joel 2 is an interesting passage where um, there's this thing called the day of the Lord is discussed. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord isn't always a pleasant thing. The day of the Lord is a thing to be dreaded, especially here. It's something that's not the, the, the happiest thing in the world. So let's look at this coming judgment we find here in the first two verses, at least first two verses. I'm going to skip over some of the, the, the meat and potatoes in chapter 2, verses uh, 11, but I think one or two give us a good description of this coming judgment, this day of the Lord. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Everybody get ready. Sound the alarm. Sound the trumpet. Tremble. Have you ever been so afraid of something, so anxious about something, it caused you to tremble? Well, that's what the words of the prophet is reminding us of. This is something to be afraid of. Something to fear. Something to, to, to keep in your mind. Something to be ready for. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Now here's why the people tremble. Verse 2 kind of sums it up here. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before. Nor will be again after them through the eyes of all, uh, years, all through the years of all generations. You see, this is a day of darkness and gloom and destruction. One of the things we've noticed in Revelation and, and studying Revelation on Wednesday nights is that, um, especially when we looked at chapters 8 and 9 and 7 trumpets here recently, we talked about the, the locust uh, aspect that's described in the seven trumpets. And, uh, you know, locusts are these, these kind of grasshoppers, they're a little bit bigger for the most part. And we learned that they're mostly proteins. If you're going to eat something very uh, nutritious and beneficial for you, more bang for your buck, get you some grasshoppers, okay? Now, if you eat liver mush, it ain't too different than liver mush, right? If you don't know what's in liver mush, don't ask, okay? Uh, but the thing about grasshoppers in the ancient world, these locusts, excuse me, is that uh, a lot of times they would swarm together in a, a ton of them at a time and just take out fields. Take out crops. 
So for the people of Joel's day, for the people of John the, uh, the uh, Revelator's day, locusts were something to be feared because they would come in this, this almost like this wrathful group to destroy crops and livelihoods. When you lived hand to mouth most days, you depend on those crops in the field, locusts were life changing, maybe life ending. <coughs> we couldn't go down to the Eagles and get something if our, if our crops or garden failed. They were dependent upon that field. So a big, huge cloud of locusts to darken the sky and to eat the vegetables, eat the crops, eat the, the food, the livelihood. This was, this was death. This is death. So for Joel, for, for the words of the prophet here, through John the Revelator, this was something to remind the people that Judgment is not something pleasant. It's just as painful, if not more so painful, than these locusts that change one's lives. So this judgment is coming one day is darkness and gloom. This ain't happy rainbows that make you feel good. There's a lot of uh, TV preachers out there who write a lot of books and a very positive message. You know, they want to empower people to do good. God wants to do good for you. All that in some ways is true. That God wants to bless us. God wants to take care of us. But the problem is, a lot of these preachers, they focus on the positive aspect, but they forget something that's very important and it's, it's an integral in the Old Testament and the New Testament that one day there is a judgment coming and this ain't pleasant. Brace yourselves. Brace yourselves. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters His voice before His army. For His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes this, His word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. But the question arises, and John Revelator echoes this later in his text, who can endure it? You know, in the uh, probably shouldn't have watched them as a kid, but in the 80s I was a fan of all these different apocalyptic type movies, Mad Max and things like that. <laughs> Look back at them now, thinking how long we watched those movies. But uh, there was a fascination in pop culture as a kid, especially I noticed this in the 80s of, of the the threat of nuclear war, the threat of the end, the end of the world. Movies like Terminator and Mad Max, all these movies I would recommend you go out and watch because they're fine and bloody. But, People fascinated with the end. That, that end is coming back in vogue in pop culture. You know, uh, you know the Hunger Games movies have, and the books have been popular, and all these different things focusing on this dystopian future where the world is broken down. <coughs> the thing is, that isn't just fantasy. That God's judgment one day will break us. God's judgment one day will tear things apart because it's deserved, isn't it? See, this judgment isn't just God being mean. This judgment isn't just God being some childish kid with a magnifying glass wanting to zap the ants with the sun being coming through the magnifying glass. This judgment, in many ways, is deserved. You see, the thing is, even from the early stages of humanity, we find the, the recollection in Genesis, you know, with the, the, the man and the woman in the garden and then some serpent tempting him. It's just disobedience. This thing called sin pops up. This thing called sin is essentially humanity thinking themselves to be better than God. Maybe thinking themselves to be their own God. It's pride. It's missing the mark. There's many ways to describe sin. A lot of people kind of dismiss it away. A lot of people try to sweep it under the rug. Well, this is not sin. But sin alienates us from a relationship with God. And deserve judgment. You know, one way that I try to rationalize it in my mind, make it simplistic for me, and I try to convey to the kids to some degree, but it, and I think about this being like a parent. You know, if I let my kids get away with anything they do bad, it's kind of, just, you know, all they, you know, they, they watch something inappropriate, or they, uh, one, well, something always happens is one brother beats up on the other brother. That's like my brothers, right? <laughs> if I just let them slide, that encourages them to do more, 
to keep doing it, a bad thing, to maybe even double and intensify it later. That I need as a parent, my wife and I need to step in and to correct them to time out, take something away, to spank, whatever is appropriate, to correct them to learn that you can't do the bad and continue doing more bad. It's detrimental to you as a human being, as a growing person. And that's one of the things about judgment and God judging. Now the final judgment might be the last thing, but when God does send some judgments in our life before the final judgment, He's trying to correct us. Like a parent trying to correct their child. Because sin has alienated us. Sin sets us on a path, sometimes a slippery slope, into destruction. God wants the best for us. But the thing is, though, one thing we need to remember, and Frederick Bigner puts this well, is that judgment is coming, but the one who judges us, or judges us finally, will be the one who loves us most fully. Just like a parent who corrects their child properly loves their child, I hope so. Sadly, in a society that we have some people who treat their children like they're animals. It happens in this county too, it's sad. But the one who judges us finally will be the one who loves us most fully. God loves us very, very much. God wants the best for every human being there is out in society, but we're the ones that are rebellious. Romans reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, none other one. Our works are like filthy rags. We deserve judgment. We deserve punishment. My wife and I got into a show recently on Netflix. Um, maybe not the most appropriate show for a minister to watch, but it's called Lucifer. It's based loosely off a comic book about what if Lucifer came to Earth and he settled in, in Los Angeles and this show kind of has him solving crimes with a detective. It's, it's interesting. But uh, that version of hell in Lucifer is interesting because people have their own little room where they uh, live in a loop where they live out their guilt. So whatever, whatever sin they had in their life that made them feel guilt, they have to experience that moment <laughs> over and over and over. I don't know what hell's like. I really don't. Um, I, I jokingly tell people if I were to imagine what hell is, in my mind, it might be a Chuck E. Cheese or something like that on a Saturday night. If you haven't been to a Chuck E. Cheese on a Saturday night, you need to go and experience the anguish and pain that is Chuck E. Cheese on Saturday night. Okay? I'll let you borrow my kids if you want to. You can take them. Me and my wife have a date night Saturday night. Y'all can take Chuck E. Cheese for us. How about that? I don't know what hell is like. But I do know this. That God doesn't want us to go there. God doesn't want to punish us. God gave us an out, didn't He? In fact, this passage, He calls us. You and y'all repent. If God were from the south, he would say y'all, right? Okay. He might have been from southern Israel, I don't know. <laughs> Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me. That Hebrew word there, shuv, is to return, to repent, to change one's direction. The Greek, uh, a lot of times in the New Testament, some words that are repent, or translate repent, or turn, or return, is uh, a word that means to change one's mind. Repent, return to me. How? With all your heart. Not just half heartedly. But come to God humbly. How? With fasting, weeping, and with mourning. It's humility, people. We need to come to God, return to Him. In fact, this is to return repentance is mentioned again in verse 13. We'll look at that in a moment. But we're to come to Him with humility, realizing that we're broken people, that we need something bigger and stronger and better, and that is God. We're imperfect. We're broken. None of us are perfect. But praise God Almighty that through Jesus Christ we can be spotless because He was perfect for us. Back in verse 2, or actually verse 11, that phrase, who can endure it? Who can endure this day of judgment? You know what John Revelator says? The Lamb, Jesus Christ. He can endure it for us if we return to God 
with our heart. And rend your garments, not actually rend your hearts, not your garments. Now notice that this repentance isn't just some dog and pony show. It's not just a, a, an absolution given by a, a, a some clergy member. This is sincerity. Rend your hearts, not your garments. It's not an act of. It's not just a visual act of religion. It's a something going on in your heart. The humility and, and sorrow in your heart. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. And why should we return? Why should we turn back to God even though uh, there's the possibility of hell hanging over us? Why should we turn to God? Because He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. He's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. He's gracious. You see, the beautiful thing about grace is, is that it's getting what we don't deserve. Our filthy rags, our sin, we deserve hell. We deserve eternal judgment. We deserve living in the loop of our guilt, living out our guilt, like that TV show. We deserve that. My kids do something bad. And sometimes we'll spank them. They deserve to be spanked. I don't get any pleasure out of it. But they deserve it. But God offers us a way to get what we don't deserve. And that's heaven and eternity. He is gracious and merciful. Praise God, He's slow to anger. I've got a temper. i got a temper. I, I, my mom has got a temper too. And uh, supposedly we get it from mom's dad, or Grandpa Whitworth. Grandpa Whitworth had a temper. But I've got a temper. So don't y'all don't make me mad. I know where all y'all live. Okay? <laughs> if I don't know you live, I can find out very quickly. That's in that age. But see, I do have a temper, but you know what? It takes an awful lot to make God angry. He's slow to anger. God loves us so much, so steadfast and so stick to it in sleep. It is anger. It's slow to anger. You know, it's easy as a parent to punish my children out of, out of anger, out of, out of just emotion. But that's not constructive, is it? The, the, the most constructive punishment for a child is to wait until you're doing it not for the sake of your anger, but for the sake of your correcting the child. That's what God does. He loves us so much and so slow to anger. That's what we deserve. The steadfast love, the Hebrew word there, the Hesed word, is, it's kind of hard to translate it. It's, it's a, a not giving up type of love. It's sticking to it. It's not, it's not giving up even when deserved to be given up on. He's not just a God of second, third chances. He's a God of fourth, fifth, and one million chances. That's the type of God we serve who loves us so much. And notice that first, our last few words are he relents over disaster. We've got to get out of jail free card. That's Jesus Christ. We deserve disaster. We deserve doom and gloom. We deserve hell. But Jesus Christ is the way that God relents over disaster. Gives us a way out. What is repentance? What is, what is this whole thing, repentance coming to God? Frederick Meekner puts it this way. To repent is to come to your senses. People come to your senses. If you don't know Jesus today, turn away from your sin. Come to your senses and realize that, that sin degrades and tears your life apart. That Jesus Christ is the only way. Come to your senses. Come to your senses. Verse 14. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent. And leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. You see, there is hope. There is hope. The repentance will be followed by restoration. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. 
Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. Even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. Make not your heritage a reproach, a bower among the nations. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? You see, this repentance thing needs to filter down from individuals to the group. That's why I said, you, know, you and y'all. The beautiful thing is, is that this is a call for people peoples to wake up. That the message of judgment, of coming judgment, needs to be spoken not just to individuals, but to the masses. There's a lot of lost people in this community. A lot of Christians who have backslid. I met a fellow the other day, uh, talking to him, and uh, come to find out, I said, you know, where do you go to church? I just politely asked, where do you go to church? Oh, I can go to this church down the road, but it's so hard to make it sometimes to schedule. My daughter's got gymnastics and this and that. I'm thinking, now hold on a minute. What's more important to God? Okay. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. That this person is so... Uh, been a, I found out they had not been to church in years. They used an excuse for something else to get away from God. They need to return. We need to share the gospel to them. Because we need to change this community. You know, it's amazing um, all the different properties that are popping up and being developed and all the people moving in our community. People need Jesus. We need to get out there and share the good news. There are people who maybe have been raised in church but no longer there. There are people that don't even know Jesus Christ and may have never heard the gospel. But more importantly, there are people who have heard the gospel but are not ready to say yes yet. We need to reach those people. We need to remind them if they don't know Jesus, that the judgment is coming. This is a hellfire and brimstone sermon. <laughs> Notice I haven't jumped up and down. I had not beat on a pole too much. I had not screamed too much. We haven't had 20 altar calls yet. We'll have an altar call in a moment, but it's not, you know. You ever been to one of those uh, sermons or one of those uh, revivals where, you know, you all bet, everybody's got to close their eyes and raise your hand if you accept Jesus. And if nobody's accepted Jesus, you probably sing for about 20, 30 minutes. You ever been to one of those services? I've been to several of those. It's not one of those services. I don't want to scare you into a relationship with Jesus if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Or if your relationship's not right with Jesus. I don't want to scare you. But you know what? When I look at the Bible, there are some scary things. Judgment is not something to look forward to. This doom and gloom we find in, in the day of the Lord and in the Joel, and we find the destruction talked about in Revelation, this the suffering. It's not something pleasant. I shouldn't have to scare you. I think the text is scary enough. But you know what? There is hope. There is hope. And going back to the Frederick Bickner quote, this judgment, the one who judges us finally will be the one who loves us most fully. God loves each and every one of you. He doesn't want you to choose the day of judgment, this destruction, He wants to bless you. But you have to come to Him. He's given us a get out of jail free card of Jesus Christ, His grace and His mercy. This cross, this, this resurrection that we're getting ready to look at next month. But we have to come to Him. We have to come to Him. As musicians come and as we sing here in a moment, um, I pray that you won't experience a judgment. If you'd like to pray and speak with me in the